Hi, my name is Archie. It's not- call me that anyway. It's a good name, has a nice ring to it, perfect amount of syllables, and it was totally given by my parents, not a licensed kids game. Names are one of the most important things given to us. It's what people will call you for the rest of your life. People associate with that name. Someone you know thinks about your name, you hope your face is the first thing that comes to their mind. If your crush remembers the Michael who was a homeless man pissing in a bottle down the street more than you, it's not worth it. Stop. Find someone else, Mike. And if you have a kid, please do not name him something stupid. Naming your child something that fits their personality, that is simple, unique, catchy, easy to remember, and not stupid can be a bit difficult. But that doesn't matter anymore because we have nicknames. Why stick to one stupid name when you can have multiple? It can be a shorting of your real name if you're boring, a completely different name if you're insecure, or have no nicknames at all if you're already really happy about yourself. At the end of the day, go nuts with your nickname. This is what you want people to call you, your new identity. If companies are doing it, why aren't you? Activision, Microsoft, Nintendo, Casio, McDonald's, Yamaha, all iconic names, all because they have no limits of what they could name themselves. No need to fit any personality, no need to name it after someone else, just pure, cool, catchy names. But even with all that, naming your business is something that is as important as naming your child. It is your child. PopCap, I am sorry what they did to you. PopCap Games, you've heard of them. If your child was in the 2000s and you had a computer, you'd definitely know these PopCap boys. They made some of the most iconic PC games of all time. Plants vs. Zombies, Bejeweled, Insane Aquarium, Zuma, Bookworms. But before all that, they used to go by the moniker Sexy Action Cool. Sexy Action Cool was an inside joke between three founders, John Vecchi, Brian Fiette, and Jason Klonker. It was the tagline for the Antonio Banderas movie Desperado. Those three words became used in real conversation between them because they thought nobody could imagine using sexy action cool in sentences. Yo, that spaghetti you made that was sexy action cool. They managed to snatch the URL sexyactioncool.com, which is now a Russian porn site. Good. Their first game was Foxy Poker, a poker game which supposedly played poker and made the women skip pots for you over your crazy poker skills. These guys made bookworms. Eventually, they had an epiphany and discovered that Sexy Action Cool was not a good name for anything but a cheap sex dungeon, and making solely strip poker games isn't a good idea if they want fans. So, they opted to change their name. And just like every parent, they started out with a base, Pop. And just like every child, you're not allowed to question it. So, they hunted for a name with Pop at the beginning by cycling through words that have become the second part of the name, putting the entire name into the search engine, with a dot com at the end, and prayed that they land on a good one. After a while, they struck gold with Pop Cap. Kabaka said they liked it because it felt like a real word. It was short, catchy, and had this good feel to it, like a bottle cap for a tasty beverage and something semi-nostalgic. That is some bullshit luck if I've ever seen one. Now, with a worse but more family-friendly name, they released their second debut, Bejeweled, as a browser game. The game sold over 10 million copies and has been downloaded more than 150 million times. The amount of people who have downloaded Bejeweled 1 rivals the amount of Nintendo DS sales, and they didn't even need Pokemon. It was clear their only direction was forward, and forward they went, releasing many classic games that any teenagers to young adults will easily recognize. They even expanded and acquired spin-top games, mainly doing casual hidden objects games. And they got another subsidiary with Fourth and Battery to focus more on the edgier side of PopCap, and released a game called Unpleasant Horse on the App Store. PopCap was pretty big around this time, and this attracted certain arts that were also on trying to swoop in and buy them at a measly $650 million. A lot of people like to say that EA ruined PopCap by buying them, which... Uh, come on, you'll just think that because EA are notorious for doing bad stuff like pay to win elements in games nowadays, which, to be fair, they did do that to PBZ too, but come on guys, EA's not good, but they didn't ruin PopCap by acquiring them. They ruined them by firing 15 employees in NA, to shift into a mobile and free-to-play games developer, shutting down a studio in Dublin, and also kicking out the creator of their most successful franchise. So join me as I venture through the amusing land of PopCap. I will be rating these games on the 9 point sack scale. You are not allowed to question it once again. Do you like breaking keyboards? Do you hate fish? Then this is the perfect game for you. Typer Shark Deluxe is a game all about typing to kill scary fish. Sharks come at you with words tattered on their bodies and you have to type the words to kill them. Welcome to Typer Shark Archie. <laughs> well, welcome to my laptop, Cyclops. Alright, before hopping into the game, let's check the Hall of Fame first, see who the real experts are. Ah, oh, these are great names! Oh my god, Salty Steve played this game? An architect? And beefy? Uh, okay, okay, enough about the Hall of Fame. Let's go train for some typing tutor. I'm sure I'll do great. There are two main modes, Adventure, this one is levels, and Abyss, try to last as long as possible. How low can you go? I'm playing this game, the bar needs to be lower. Alright, let's press play, choose the difficulty. Oh, this one's shouting at me, let's pick that! When will I learn? I like Abysses more anyway. So this game is all about typing. You see the letters? You go nuts! There's different types of these fishies, the first one being these sharks, they're normal enemies, these short little fish that are speedy but only require one letter to destroy. Sometimes you get these tiny fish that are assassins, with their very high speeds and dark colors so they blend in with the background making it hard for you to see them. 
And as you go on, they will have more layers. You have to type in two words to destroy this hammerhead completely. Also, there are these jellyfish, they're just bonuses. They just float up inside the left. In the adventure levels, there are boss fights, which I admit are pretty good. And that's it. That's it for the type of shark deluxe. You just go until you can anymore. Simple as that. If you like endurance tests and are a fast typer, you'll love this game. But as someone who's very, very patient and is for it, this is hell. Good hell, but hell. Oh, and also, uh, I can't close it on Steam. I close the game, it doesn't work. I press stop, it doesn't work. And Steam through Task Manager, it doesn't work. The only way to make it stop running is by restarting my whole computer. Another incentive to never ever touch this game ever. And jokes aside, it's still a pretty fun game in the first few minutes, but by the 10th, I just get bored. There's a much, much better game about fights I'll get to later. Oh wow, well, this one's screaming at me too! Dino My Deluxe is a matching game. You have these dinosaurs on the bottom, match the colors with the ones up top, make omelets. Very simple game, four modes to choose from. The first one is a regular survival test, but every time the sand in that hourglass reaches the bottom, this f***er will add a new color to the whole puzzle. The second one is called Stomped. Too slow? Here's feet. Third one is Fossil. You have to make sure no eggs are touching the fossil to make it drop and collect it. Two modes in this one, Strategic, the slower paced but more complicated one, and Panic. It's less complex, but the puzzle moves slightly down at a time, and if you're too slow, you know what's coming. If there was a linear story mode for this game, this would be it. 14 fossils to assemble, and after you get the last one, this happens. Cool. The last mode is Time Trial, remove all eggs as fast as possible. That's it. I mean, it's not exactly the pinnacle of gaming, it's a matching game, what more do you want from me? Although I do vividly remember playing this game as a child, and when playing it this time, hearing the irritating sounds, the MIDI songs, seeing the suboptimal visuals, they do elicit a feeling of nostalgia and dread and sadness. And then I actually play the game and all I feel are the last two. Here's something different, a side-scroller shoot-em-up. Heavy Weapon Deluxe is a game all about the- You guide this little tank guy, aim with your mouse, and shoot with the left click. Click the right click 60 seconds to your bunker. Now I haven't played many shoot em ups in my life, let alone a side scroll shoot em up about taking down Solid, but this was a pretty good experience. The controls are very weird and the game knows that. You aim with your mouse, but you also move with your mouse. That's right, no west action over here. Us Americans only use this mouse thing to move our troops. And the tank moves faster if your mouse is farther away from it. Combine that with the fact that you're also aiming while moving, it creates a great experience. Frantically trying to move past and shoot the bullets and rockets coming at you, hoping that when you aim you don't accidentally run into other projectiles. There are these missile shots that come at you from the side, so when you try to shoot at them, you instead move towards them like a madman and the game knows that, so they make the trucks shoot curved bullets. Also, you have power-ups that fall from the sky from this friendly white chinook. You can get powers for guns, for shields, and other nuke as f civilians. Or you can get these special blobs that you can get from destroying enemies which fill up the bar for a mega laser. Guess what that does when it's filled up? This is the best game I've played so far and people seem to agree with it with the actual existence of a Metacritic page. With a 77 by critic score, this is an outrage. Reason or disrespect aside, it's still a definite thumbs up for me. Unless you're a communist, give this one a go. Especially if you have a Zebo around your house. We're not getting away from American foes just yet. Italy, here we come. Pizza Frenzy is a pizza delivery game, the most oversaturated video game genre. From a top-down perspective, you have to get these civilians orders symbolized by these bubbles with the poppings to the correct pizza shops. You start off with two, and when you get onto the later levels, you can have more of them. It sounds simple enough, but if you think this game is solely RNG, well, mama mia, I didn't know I was dealing with a dumbass. Although it does seem like this game would be simple and mediocre, it picks up pretty quickly and proves itself to be a really fun time. This game tests your reaction time, speed, patience, awareness, and race to conclude if you're a true Italian at heart. How does it do that? We'll start off with the basics. How do you play this game? As I mentioned before, you get these pizza icons and send them to the correct shops to get the order. You get the correct order, you get some money in the tip jar, you get some money in the tip jar, you get stars, you get enough stars by the end of the day. I found the perfect song! How is this not random, you might ask? Well, if you look at the top, you have these coupons, and these are the tickets that will provide us the entry to see firsthand the Italian promised land. By just clicking on them with the pizza in hand, or clicking on them first and then on the pizza order, you can change the toppings to be the one of the coupons and that is how you get streaks. But be wise, because inflation. But that is not all this game has to offer because you have special customers. Uh, life lesson, if you see a criminal ordering a pizza from your place, make the cops cook the pizza for you. There's this super famous guy who gives you money, some bums who chase their orders every few seconds, so you can either change their order immediately or risk losing their order and wait for a few seconds to make them change their orders themselves. Real impatient hobos, aren't they? There's this woman who changes everyone's orders to match first, make sure you save up coupons for her, that did not sound right. There are loads more of them and other unique stuff, and in conjunction with the face pizza frenzy throws the show at you, makes this a must-try game in my eyes. Very solid.
All right, with the help of the super dual communism in Italy, we are on a roll here. Let's see if we can keep the energy going. Oh, hell yeah! I will categorize these games as one with the label Hidden Object Games, because there are objects that are hidden in these... Sure, games. A vast majority of them were made by PopCap subsidiary Spin Top Games. These Spin Top fellows are known for these types of games. On the Wikipedia page, all of their games are the Hidden Objects kind. And Solitaire, which isn't Solitaire. I'm not going to spend too much time on these because they're self-explanatory. Best explain when you play them. They're not really good. They hurt your eyes. Look, I played these games as a kid. I was really good at them. I remember there was a level in San Francisco, the sea, the ship. I came back now, and I don't like it. It's like Pizza Frenzy, PVZ, San Aquarium, and Bookworms. When I played them again around a decade after not touching them at all, I got a big smile on my face. They felt magical. These are tragical. Well, maybe not, but they're not good. Yeah, I get nostalgia from them, but I don't want to purely use nostalgia to rate these, and I don't even get that much nostalgia. It probably just falls on the fact that I'm maybe not so interested in hidden object games, or I'm only used to hate Joe games when the graphics are childlike, but this is just not my play to lasagna. I play the game and I get bored within 5 minutes. You should still check this out yourself if you're into this kind of stuff and want to get feel of that early 2k vibe, but for me, the only thing hidden in this game is my amusement, ha ha ha. Wait, they made this game? Peggle is a casual puzzle top-down shoot things in things game. It's the most marketable genre. Take the dinosaurs, turn them upside down. When they were making Peggle, they were heavily inspired by pachinko machines, making this the best rendition of a pachinko machine I've seen in a video game in the 2000s. But it was kind of the complete opposite of a pachinko machine where you would try to align yourself perfectly so the ball would bounce off the pegs into the big jackpot bucket underneath. They thought of something which every struggling game developer should think about when they run out of ideas. Mix it with Breakout. You shoot balls from up top and you have to destroy these orange pegs and bricks before you run out of ammo for completion, and these blue pegs for fun. Sometimes purple and green pegs appear which give you more points and special abilities for some characters respectively. The unicorn shows you where to go, the beaver throws another ball on the map, the sunflower went downhill, space pinball. I've personally never been a fan of Peggle compared to other PopCat titles, I didn't play any of the games. My family was a dynamite household, we were too good for Peggle. I mean I was aware of this game's existence, I saw a YouTube video years ago of a group of friends playing the sequel, but I did not at all make the connection that these games were made by the makers of the fish game. But when I did play it, it was alright. Definitely hooked me for about 15 minutes, but after then it got kinda of stale. I feel like this game would be more fun for me if it had more challenges, maybe an online multiplayer, or even a gruesome version where Bjorn is turned into a hideous group. Holy sh! While I only somewhat enjoyed it, a lot of people enjoyed it. This is evident by the fact that this game has a lot of sequels and spin-offs, including one for mobile, one for the DS, one for serial killers. Although the sequels and spin-offs had some issues, it shows that Peggle is a series that has a pretty big cult following because it has a good concept. And Peggle Knights, or Peggle 1.5 as no one but me calls it, has an 89 or Metacritic, making it better than Ah. Oh god, that aside, even if I don't enjoy it as much as others, Peggle is something that everyone should try at least once. It has a lot of good stuff going for it. It can look nice and give you a nightmare. I'll keep it brief with this one. Bejeweled, the legendary Match 3 casual puzzle series started in 2000. Their real debut post the sexy action cool days. Although not the OG Match 3 as a subtle versus Shiriki, some have pointed Bejeweled as the game that blew Match 3 up, and it's clear to see why. Bright eye-catching visuals and satisfying slot sound effects complement the genre so well. The addictive nature of Match 3 is mixed in with the eye in the air candy creates the perfect storm that will get you stuck in this game for hours. Speaking of candy, my god is this game influential. The term Match 3 games was coined when this game was sported out. When people say Match 3, they don't think of Tetris or Dr. Mario or Dynamite. They think of Bejeweled and Candy Crush. Y yeah, sure, you too. All these games have many things in common, such as the happy vibes, sweet visuals, the addictive substances they put in them that cannot be FDA approved, nice sound effects, porn, everything. No one can doubt the series' importance in the world of casual mobile cash grab games, but what about the games themselves? They're fine. They're nothing special. They're... They're match 3 games. They don't have a storyline, they don't have a tough gameplay, they don't have naked girls. Are they better than Candy Crush? Doing heroin is better than playing that. Are they interesting? Yeah, of course. The colors, the soundtrack, the background, and the overall vibes in the game are... In my opinion, the best in any match threes out there. But there's still match threes. Good match threes, but a cherry blossom tree, so a tree, ain't it? Now this is something more up my alley. Zoom is technically another match three, but a pineapple tree is in a tree. Pop guy basically took dynamite and went, make it walk. Zoom is a game where you shoot balls into similarly colored moving balls and make them disappear. What is the challenge? Please put on your glasses. These maps are designed beautifully to absolutely f you over with their overlapping lanes. 
Combining that with the speed and variety of balls that are added to progress makes this a challenging but fun experience. I played this game so damn much as a kid, sitting in front of my old family computer putting hours into this game a week. That's why I wasn't colorblind. Zuma was seen as a success to pop up and they released a sequel in Zuma's Revenge, which made me realize that I do not know what a Zuma is supposed to be. Is it the balls? The turret? The guy? Whatever it is, he wants revenge. Man, Zuma sure is a great game that came from pop up, isn't it? Ah, uh, fuck. Yeah, it turns out the Zuma was, a. Uh... <coughs> Heavily inspired by the arcade game Puzzle by Mitchell Corporation, the now defunct Japanese game dev. It's crystal clear. When asked about it in an interview, Kapaka said some bullshit. He began by saying that if you look at both games together, you'll see that Zuma is certainly a different game and not an exact clone. That sense is fine. The next is less fun. I've reached the point where I've accepted that the clones are here to stay. Mostly I'm happy if the clones add something interesting to the gameplay because that is how the games evolve. People do take ideas that were there before and then elaborate on them and add stuff. Jewel Quest, for example, is a game that does borrow from the jewel, but it adds some elements of its own that are unique and that we hadn't thought of. Ah uh, yes, the number one defense of being accused of farting at dinner. Say you let other people sh** your food. If you still think that's somewhat reasonable, I don't blame you. I would say I'm a pretty lenient person myself. Let's see what the president of Mitchell Corp, Mr. Ryozaki, has to say when talking about a final report against Sack. Popcat Games' lawyer replied to my mail in the one from my lawyer's office. In essence, they don't give a shit. I think they knew what they were doing from the start and they are bad businessmen. Ripping off someone else's idea is bad, they don't belong in the game business. Now, I know it's heartbreaking to see the press of Paul could be like this, but I have to side with the Japanese on this one. Even with that, this game is still pretty great and I would say it evolved puzzle into something much better. I would actually agree with Kapanka's statement a bit if it weren't for the dookie in my pizza. <laughs> Alright, let's return to the deep ocean with Insane Aquarium. If in Cyber Shark Deluxe you use your keyboard to kill fish, in Insane Aquarium you use your mouse to take care of fish. You click to feed them, collect coins, buy stuff, destroy pollution, choose three paths to help you in your journey, get more upgrades as you go along, buy more fish, buy more special items to help you even more, and get the ultimate goal of a full egg, which contains your next pet that you can choose. You think Pizza Frenzy tests your reflex focus and speed? Nah, man, the Italians are going down in the fins of these guppies. When the game starts off, you have two guppies and whatever pets you chose. As the game goes on, you get these upgrades that let you have more fish food at a time, drug addiction, better drugs, cannibalism, Mario, gun violence, the flu. How you get the egg is a bit nonsensical. Who buys an egg in three pieces? But it creates a nice progression. When you get the first piece, you feel like you've actually started. The second part signals that you're pretty much done and you just need some time to get the final egg. Damn, even me explaining it is getting you hyped up, isn't it? Please call back. I haven't even mentioned the main enemies of the game. Aliens from another universe sometimes appear via a rift, and they have different methods of eating and defeating. Sylvester and Balrog are normal enemies. They eat, you shoot. Meanwhile, Gus, he's not affected by lasers, so you have to kill him by making him eat. Fish food, guppies, star potions, all sorts. This is another reason why I and so many people love this game. Every alien is different with different methods of destruction, and it's your job to learn every single one of them and which levels they appear in. F I haven't talked about the pets yet. I'll keep this short, but the pets are your little helpers. Every pet is different with different methods of helping you. Pick three each time you start a new level, hatch one every time you add one. This game is really good. It's basically a simulation game like those you find at your local play store, but Popcat made it as if it was an arcade game. Starting over your same completed game, beginning differently by changing pets, and all of that mixed in with nostalgia? They have struggled yet again. This is a must play in Popcap's catalog and a must play in nostalgic video games. What started out as a humble worm finding words in a pile of letters became a massive adventure we had to save his princess from all over the world. If that doesn't sound amazing to you, then get out of my library. Bookworms, the original game, is a simple word forming puzzle game. Stare at the letters, come up with a three letter word because you're foreign, repeat. But what I want to talk about is Bookworm Adventures. This is one of the most impressive left turns I've ever seen in a video game franchise, rivaling Angry Birds Epic. If the original is just a normal educational kids game, Ventures is a straight up RPG. PopCap spent about 2 years and $700,000 in contrast to their casual games which only take about 3 months and $100,000 by 3 guys. They were determined to make this stupid word game to be a massive piece role playing adventure and they knocked it out of the park. In these games, you find words in 16 letters and attack the enemies with them. The acts are divided by books, 1, 2, 3 for the first game, 4, 5, 6 for the second. The first one is based around Greek, Arabic, and Gothic fictions for books 1, 2, and 3 respectively. Dusa, Hydra, Satan, Grim Reaper, everyone and their cousins are here. Figure out the longest word you can find in these 16 letters. The longer the word, the more the ouch. And you get these gemmed letters that can do certain effects that go up in severity based on how long the word you made was. When played, they can do things such as poison, burn and weaken the enemy, or heal legs, all according to colors, while also providing you a damage boost. Following Popcap's fetishes with three pre-game pets, you pick three treasures at the start of each chapter to help you complete that chapter. Some will make your attacks hit extra hard if you spell certain words, such as words with an X, a Y, or a Z, 
a color, a metal, or they can negate some damage if you're a coward. The enemies in this game are very well thought out. They have their own explanation, every single chapter is different enemies with a unique set of moves, and they hit hard. Some can take more than half of your health, while some chip away by throwing a fight at you, and some are just straight up annoying. They can break your tiles, making them playable but worthless. They can disable your tiles, making them unplayable. They can cleanse your tiles, making the gems disappear so they're just normal tiles now. And they'll do that until your whole board looks like this. I've left out a lot of information about Pokemon Adventures. That's because one, I still want live in my mouth. So play this game. This is a must play game, especially for those who love RPGs, through based combats, and dictionaries. It's fun, addicting, satisfying, and dare I say, educational. <laughs> When I was a mere young and I spent a lot of my time playing games on my PC. This was back in the late 2000s. Yeah, it was something special. A lot of the games were already pre-installed into the computer from what I would assume are completely legal sources. <clears throat> that computer is how I played the games I mentioned I had played in my childhood. I would not be surprised at all if the series played a major part of learning English and made English the easiest school subject for me by far. It led me to today talking to a brick wall. So what are you waiting for? Play it. You can finish it in about 3-4 to four hours, and when you're done, you can go back and do it all again. Or play the sequel, which is even better than the first one. Play it. Play it. Play it. Aw, oh, for f**k's sake. Yep, the games were deleted off of the internet, so the only way for you to get them is through a shady download save, and pray to god that you don't get malware. But if you do decide to play this, you'll feel that they went all in on this, and it shows in the form of a couple of the best games they've ever released. Now to the best games they've ever released. Being introduced to plants or zombies is like being introduced to your own parents. Like, okay, if you like flowers, you like coffee, you like sugar, you already knew about this. Why are you telling me this shit? In April Fool's 2009, PopCap released a music video starring some plants and some zombies singing a tune called There's a Zombie on Your Lawn. Some gamers thought this was just a prank, but others were hopeful that PopCap were releasing a brand new game about flowers and the undead. On the official PopCap Games website, it stated that their newest game, Plants vs. Zombies, was set to release on May 5th. People were excited. They were confident that PBZ was going to be the next classic and May 5th came around. Oh my god, they were so right. Plants vs. Zombies is one of my favorite games ever, probably my favorite tower defense game. Can you attribute that fact to nostalgia? Yeah. But can you attribute that fact to the quality of the game? Hell yes. How does this game work? Do you know how to breathe? PvZ is a game where you have to work on defending your house from a horde of zombies with plants. Similar to Insane Aquarium, each time you complete a level, you acquire a new plant to use, starting out with the puny pea shooter and ending up with the ultimate sign of dominance, two pea shooters. But as you progress with your plants, the zombies reach the Iron Age, and also bungee jumping. And also yetis. Every single plant and zombie are fantastic. The amount, 49 plants just right. All of them interesting, all of them cute, all of them useful. I can only really point to one that's kind of useless. Cactus, maybe Chomper, but they're not useless, they're just replaceable. It's the zombies, every single one of them have distinct characteristics that make them so different from the last. You got the basic, you got the paint bucket, you got the Brady, you got Mikey Jackman, you got your dad. There's the ridiculously fun mini games, the Zen Garden, Crazy Dave, the Achievements, the Cheat Codes, the goddamn soundtrack. This game even got ports of the 360 and DS, and I've only heard good things about them. All in all, Plants vs. Zombies is a marvelous, top notch, entertaining, easy to find, must play game. Combined with how well this game sold, of course a piece of media of this caliber needs sequels. Let's see what they do. Uh oh. April 5th, 2011, PopCap was bought by Big Boy Electronic Arts, or as some of you would call them, Scum. After changing PopCap's logo and laying off dozens of employees around the world, in 2013, we saw the sequel of the beloved game Plants vs. Zombies 2, and right off the bat, you can see why people blame EA for killing PBZ. Free game, microtransactions. Nowadays, this is a staple in mobile games. Hell, games in general. But one, this was nearly a decade ago, and two, just look at this. No! You can't do this, PopCap! Sure, you have many new plants here, but why put the OGs behind a paywall? It's better off not putting them there in the first place. And if that's not enough, rumors about the designer of PVC, George Fan, being fired from PopCap just because he disagreed with the freemium aspects of Zombies 2 roamed around the internet. Fan has commented on both of these, but never put one and one together, so let's not jump into conclusions. But I would not be surprised at all if this is the truth, since nobody likes pay to win, or in this case, pay to see your family. How's the game? Comparing it to one, this has far less memorable plants. Who's gonna go around starting a religion from Bloomerang like they did for Cat's Tale? There's around 69 free plants which you can get by actually playing the game. That number is surprising to me since there are 11 worlds and over 300 levels compared to one's 5 and 50. An impressive amount, no doubt, but sadly, the sacrifice was the mini game from the first game. The only existing remains of them are found in challenge levels that occasionally appear throughout the worlds, endless zones, and vase breakers, along with the new addition of two game modes, Arena and Penny's Pursuit. So that was the main game? It's pretty great, honestly. When it was released, it had a different format to what we have now. It involved keys and doors, and starts ratings, decisions. It wasn't the linear one-way street arcade-style game that we grew up with. 
I got the game around the time it came out, I thought it was fine. I was still a single digit boy, so I didn't really get it or like the different mechanics it had. Seems like the branching system didn't appeal to this nine year old's brain. Nothing's really changed, I still don't like making decisions, that's why I love this so much. So, combining the fact that I was still very, very young, didn't like the branching system, and was using a defective tablet, I threw away the game. Years later, after I got a competent phone and could legally make a Google account, I redownloaded it and gave it a second shot. I was shocked at how much it changed, there were way more maps, and most jarring of all, they were linear. Neatly packed, no keys and doors and bullshit, just your classic PVZ business. There's not much more I can say about the gameplay other than this is PVZ1 but HD, and by HD I mean hard to. The difficulty of this game is insane. If Zombies 1 was a 3 on the hardness scale, PVZ2 was like an 8.675. It was very much appreciated to have a harder game as a sequel, but god damn this is tough. You'll know what I'm talking about when you reach Jurassic March and Big Wave Beach. F***ing octopus. I still think it's fun and... Honestly, I think it's smart to make this game challenging. The players get more chances to explore their decks, test out new combos, and see what works and what doesn't, and EA gets more money from frustrated players giving in. One aspect that I don't really like is the leveling system. It doesn't bother me as much as other players since I can play the game just fine without it, but it just feels less plants for zombie-y and only there for the sake of following trends. On the other side, one aspect that I love about 2 is the plant food. It is essentially a performance enhancing drug that makes your plants squirt out whatever special ability they have. This single power-up is what I consider to be an undeniable evolution from PVZ1. So despite everyone saying that the sequel is bad and EA killed PVZ, it's still a very, very fun game that you should absolutely try out. Just be ready for everything, because that is what this game is going to throw at you. After this, the boys went to show PopCap's strong love for wars with third-person shooter games. I've never played any of these, but reviews have told me that they are good, very good. After that, they went to show PopCap's strong love for paper with the card-based game for mobile, Plants vs. Zombies Heroes. I'm not a big fan of these types of games, they didn't really click with me when I played it, but it looked like someone using the card games would like. It's like Hearthstone, but for infants. But we all were craving for one thing and one thing only. The third game. And on July 16th, 2019, we were treated to a glorious pre-alpha. And by we, I mean US and Canada, and by glorious, I mean slightly concerning. It didn't drop over here, so I can only look back at a few of the footage that are still around, and... It looks... Different. It's standing. Why? Bet you haven't heard this before, it looks like Clash Royale. Yeah, but whatever, this is just the pre-alpha, don't think too much of it, because in February 2020, they released a proper soft launch for the game in three countries, including the one that I live in, so I got it, and... Oh god, bet you haven't heard this before, it looks like shit. What the hell did they do to my boys? Seems like they went for a more adult approach with the gloomier, less cartoony and 3D styles. I don't understand, they look good in the shooter games, why do they look so bad here? Speaking of bad, the gameplay, Clash Royale. Sunflowers are essentially your elixirs, lawnmowers are gone, every level is split into two with the second half introducing taco time, player levels, and a tower mechanic. Those last two are very important since they are completely new to PvZ, the closest thing being the arena in the second game. And now it's the main adventure mode. I'm sure you've played mobile games that have a similar system, but basically the tower operates on your skill level. The higher you go, the harder the enemies and the more levels you need, so you need to grind on lower floors and random encounters that appear in the hub world. I guess they didn't understand me when I said I love this. So, a beloved masterpiece has been seemingly turned into a generic mobile cash grab game by one of the most hated companies in the whole world. I wonder if the public liked this one. People were not happy about me. They went off and blamed EA. Most of us were confident that PvZ3 was going to be like this, and rightfully so. Comparing the two versions that are 8 months apart, the change is barely noticeable. But in September 2021, PopCap did something unexpected. They listened. They managed to convince the public to put down the pitchforks by putting down the game. And they got rid of the Clash Royale elixir shenanigans and brought back Suns and Sunflowers. Oh good lord. Yeah, it goes up in increments of 1 instead of 25s and 50s like the previous games. Sure. Looking at it from the outside, it definitely seems to be a lot more linear with its levels. Uh, none of this tower bullshit. They don't allow you to pick your plants, which might be the plan for PvZ3, making the players think about the combo they've been given rather than trying certain combos to solve the level. And as much as I love experimenting with plants, I'm open with this change. Yeah, this might turn into more of a puzzle game than a tower defense game, but it's much better than what was happening pre-apocalypse. Although, something that people have mentioned that I agree with is that PvZ is becoming more and more generic with each game. They also point out how the series is losing its iconic style, and I can see where they're coming from. I mean, just by making the sun count by one, it strips away an iconic feature of the franchise. And to be honest, I do see some similarities between 3 and other basic-ass mobile games, but honestly, I don't think it matters that much. Don't be such a f***ing old head about it and only get angry at the game because it didn't look the same as it was a decade ago. I'm still gonna give it a go when it comes out and cross my fingers until then, and most people should and will probably do the same. Plants vs Zombies is a phenomenal game. 
Plants vs. Zombies is a phenomenal series with a few minor errors and seems like it's going down a, dim pa no, a dimmer path. Although I do think that PvZ The Game is worthy of a perfect 9, this series as a whole gets an 8.675. So that's all. Well, not all. They've got a lot of stuff they didn't talk about, but that's all I thought were important. Important to who? Important to me. PopCap Games are among those responsible for my childhood being what it is. An introverted smartass who does nothing but play games. I learned it young. I must have been around 7 or 8 when I played these games. Ages I haven't passed yet if you added one before them. Apart from Peggle, every single one of these games I played when other kids were riding bikes and flying kites. Why go outside when you can go outside? I am aware I've only mentioned about 10% of their whole catalog, but honestly, you would have to be a slightly altered clone of me to even be aware of their existence. And since I'm not an altered clone of myself and I can't speak with them, I'm not gonna bother talking about them thoroughly. If you want to see what they're like, just look at this Wikipedia page and see what sounds interesting and see if they're on Steam or something. If not, prison! And while you're on that site, you might be slapped in the face by the fact that PopCap Games has been turned into a mobile game developer, which... Man, a once great developer now turned cash grab, whatever. People have been very, very, very critical of EA for ruining PopCap or killing plants for zombies, but in my very childish flawed views of alternate universes, had they not bought PopCap, I think they would have done McLean. PvZ2 wouldn't be as fleshed out as it is, and 3 wouldn't exist because of lack of funds. In my eyes, the only way that'll happen if PopCap stayed independent would be from the strength of nostalgia, fanbase, and crowdfunding. Zombies number 9, anyone? Yeah, this is all speculations. I'm sorry I can predict that didn't happen. And come on, Plan for the Zombies 2 is still fantastic. Even without EA's bullshit, you can finish the game without issue. And PvZ3 has gotten some big improvements, so we might have another classic coming down our throats. Now, I'm not saying that EA is an angel or anything. They've shut down multiple PopCap offices and kicked out one of the most influential people in the history of PCG. And just look up why EA bad. You'll get enough stuff to read it for a lifetime. I'm just saying that I think people are overreacting a bit, and I don't agree with a lot of what people have said about the relationship. Though I can't really say that I'm not at the very least affected that they turned my beloved childhood heroes into sign flippers. That stings. But one thing I'm surprised about is how long they've lasted since they were bought. Big companies should have known small companies after playing them as a tradition in game culture. So for PopCap to last a decade since then and their latest great game under EA was around the time they were bought and instead of releasing almost nothing but cash grabs? That's impressive. Thanks for that, Electronic Arts. Wow, well, look at that. They got their first thank you of the year. We're only halfway in. What a record. Again, I'm not saying they're gods. I'm just saying they're gods. So for them to spare PopCap for so long that babies born at the time they acquired them can now play Madagascar is worthy of a golf play. Do I wish PopCap was treated better? Don't make me remind you how to breathe again. But is that gonna happen? You suck in air and then you blow it out. This is EA we're talking about. The first company that pops into most people's heads when I say microtransactions. They have created casino games that are about sports. Nothing's gonna stop them from creating profit and pay to win games. Not even lawsuits. It's been over a decade since FIFA Ultimate Team was released, so why aren't we at the fifth stage of grief already? Just accept that EA won't stop doing this and you'll come to the realization that, you know, zombies too got it easy. I mean, sure we were hit hard by Japan in World War II, but at least we were nuked two times less than them. We are lucky PvZ2 isn't completely littered with loot boxes. There are some, but the game is still very much possible to be without spending a single penny. And when you finally come to that conclusion, it'll all be fine until you have another realization. Oh god! I'm scared about what Zombies 2 is gonna be like with the microtransactions, but... Honestly, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for what? It doesn't matter for PopCap's legacy, future, and public opinion. I don't think PopCap's legacy and how the public see them will change drastically for the worse. I mean, most of us only know them for games from two decades ago anyways. They'd have to make Nazi propaganda to make the public hate them. Will it change for the better, then? Uh, can it? Well, of course it can, but... 98% of the hate on this subject is not directed at PopCap, they're directed at EA. PopCap's legacy is not hated by the public, EA's doings towards them are. So even if they make the Tepipa Butterfly of gaming, their public opinion will not severely go up, because they were never severely down. As for the future, PopCap, I wish the best for your next decade under EA's wing. I do not know what they have planned for you, you could be making Bejeweled 79 for mobile, but Hey, maybe you're creating Insane Aquarium 2, or you might be developing Bookworm Adventures 3, or maybe Amazing Adventures taken to Detroit, or maybe you'll get disbanded like all the other companies they bought. Whatever it is, I hope everything goes well for you and your workers. You have made my childhood. If it weren't for you, these bricks would not have my spit all over them, and for that, thank you. Thank you for creating my past, my present, and possibly my future too. Even if now you're making games that future generations would call Candy Crush ripoffs, you'll always be the sexiest, actionist, and coolest developers in my heart.